Hello, and welcome to the Five Core Life Podcast with Will Moore, founder of More Momentum. In today's episode, Will is talking about how some of the most traumatic experience and times in our lives can actually put what's truly important into perspective. Will's guest, Jason Kalipa, is a world-class CrossFit champion and experienced this firsthand when his own daughter became very ill. Jason talks about what he's doing now to give back to other families and children in similar situations, as well as what he does in order to stay on track to his goals using something called micro check-ins. If you haven't already, go ahead and pound that subscribe button so you get notified when episodes air every week. Are you ready to fire in all cylinders? If so, let's go. Welcome everybody to another episode of Five Core Live, Five Core Life. We're here with Mr. Jason Kalipa. His resume, I can't do justice to his resume. So welcome, Jason. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are what you've accomplished thus far and where you're headed into the future. Yeah, I mean, so my background is uh, I competed professionally in the sport of CrossFit for a long time, about a decade. I won the CrossFit Games, got back on the podium a few times. I own a company called NC Fit. We have locations globally. We also have a digital model and we have corporate wellness. And I have two kids, married my wife out of, actually we met in high school and, um, yeah, it's about it. CrossFit Games champ, big into jiu-jitsu, all things fitness, own a company, and like family stuff. It's all just like you, you know? Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. I mean, fa- you know, family family comes first, right? I, when you, it, It's funny. When you're a younger guy, I don't know if you experience this, but most of the people I talk to that have families kind of, it, it's, it's a very common sequence of, you know, when you're young, you're very selfish and it's all about you and making as much money as you can. And then you meet your, you know, your spouse it becomes your wife. And then you're like, all right, there's two of us now. We're kind of a team here. And, you know, they become a priority. And then, you know, you have kids and it's like game over. It's like, okay, I'm like in the background here and I'm just trying to make sure that these people are taken care of. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I had, so I have two kids, one's 10 and one's seven, and we had kids relatively young. And so I know exactly what you mean. Right on. Yeah. So so tell me, it, I, I noticed in your profile that you didn't do organized sports in high school. Is that correct? No, in high school, I played football and uh, I also threw the shot. In college, I was just kind of a, I joked around too much in high school. I didn't get into the, the college I was looking for. And so I worked at, uh, I started working at a traditional gym. And that's really how I got introduced to fitness and entrepreneurship and the idea of business. So I worked full time, went to school full time in college. I actually went to a junior college for two years because I couldn't get accepted into the college I wanted. And then I ended up graduating with my peers uh, four years later. I didn't play collegiate sports for a variety of reasons, primarily because of my own lack of drive and effort that I put in high school and I had to kind of get woken up in college. Yeah, right. I mean, and that's, you know, I didn't do sports in college either. I did, I did basketball and, and a couple other sports in high school. And I'm glad I didn't go. I don't know. I, got the, I feel like my, I was in a fraternity that had a, and a bunch of my friends were athletes and it was like, it was very taxing. It was a, it was a, it was a very big responsibility to be on uh, a college kid's shoulders when they're trying to balance, you know, fun and, and homework and, um, you know, then the, the sports aspect. But I also have friends that, that loved it and, and had a great experience from it. So I think he made a good choice. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't even, I mean, coming out of high school, I had a few opportunities. I just didn't, I didn't optimize it. And then I started, I was already working at the, the health club. And so then I, I went really all in. I started selling gym memberships when I was, you know, a freshman in high school, uh, college. And I just stayed doing that until I graduated. And then I opened up the, the business. Yep. And so um, speaking of your kids, so your daughter was diagnosed with leukemia. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. I mean, do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of that experience of, you know, how that went down and now what you're doing? I know you're trying to spread awareness on it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so in 2016, so I competed professionally in CrossFit up until Ava got sick. When Ava got sick, um, I had, or I didn't have to, I wanted to make the pivot from competing professionally. I just didn't have the time, uh, nor did I have the desire when, uh, after finding that type of news out. And so she was diagnosed with leukemia in January of 2016. And then the way leukemia treatment works um, for girls is the two and a half year treatment process. And so we were in the hospital a lot for the next two and a half years and, you know, really learned a lot, grew a lot, found out what was important. And one of the big kickers 
is, you know, I felt like we were really well positioned to take on the battle. And I, I, I encourage anybody listening, you never know when life's going to come and kind of kick you in the nuts a little bit. And if you could really work hard now to work hard to try and build a financial head hedge, uh, be in the gym to build up your fitness and, you know, create long lasting, really good relationships that are legitimate. When life does throw your curveball, you'll be better to attack it. And uh, fortunately, we had, you know, all, all things stacked in our favor. And um, it was still really, really difficult, but we were able to get through it. Well, you just hit three of the five cores right there. Um, relationships, physical health, career and finance, um, and obviously mindset and emotional health tie into those as well. Um, the giving back portion of the emotional health, clearly you're, you're doing that. You're spreading awareness. You're using your celebrity and your notoriety to, to get the message out, right? I mean, you know, sometimes... I look at the day and age that we're in and technology can be a negative thing, you know, with social media sometimes and how it's used. And, you know, I'm sure you're aware teen suicides at an all time high and, you know, we're actually becoming less happy according to the world happiness report. But then, you know, people like you and me and, and others out there that are like using it to actually do some good and spread awareness. And, you know, you wouldn't be able to do that, you know, 50 years ago, even, even 15 years ago. So I, I think that's great. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so we host an annual fundraiser. My wife does called Ava's Kitchen. It's in February. COVID uh, threw a wrench in it last year, but it's back this year. And uh, it's held at the 49ers Stadium. It's an amazing event. And we fundraise heavily for families fighting pediatric cancer. And we're able to go do a lot of good with that. And you're right. Social media is a way to connect with people. It's a blessing and a curse, right? It's a, it could be really, really dark, but it could also be really bright. In the sense that when things are really challenging, you could find like-minded people who've gone through similar situations. And if we could help those people, that's incredible. Um, another thing that I'm really, really, really drawn to is uh, blood drives. I just think that it's not enough people donate blood. I think it's a really easy thing to do and it doesn't cost any money. It could save a life. So uh, we, we host regular blood drives and we also do um, philanthropic efforts through uh, Ava's Kitchen. Well, just to bring a little bit more awareness to blood drives, I, I'm your perfect example of somebody that is not aware. It's not even on my radar to donate blood. I'm like, why would I donate blood? It sounds so ignorant, I'm sure. But why don't you educate me and the and our viewers here on why it's so important? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I would I would say there's two things I think everybody should do. And I really feel strongly about this. The first one is to look up Be the Match and to do a cotton swab. Uh, you never know if you'll ever need a bone marrow transplant or if one of your children or one of your friends or family members will. And the wider we cast the net, the more likely you can have to have a, a good match. So the way the bone marrow transplants work is there's like 10 key factors. And essentially, if you match, the more you match, the better off it's going to take to your body. So if you just cut and swab, you throw this sample out in the world, maybe one day you get hit up and say, hey, you, you match somebody, would you like to donate your blood bone marrow? Which is it's a little bit of a process, but at least you have that opportunity to know if you can. So be the match is one thing. Uh, and I didn't know about that until Ava uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. And you meet all these children in the hospital who need bone marrow transplants. You just wish that the net was wider. The second thing is obviously blood products. So blood products cannot be made. They cannot be cr created. They have to be donated. And they have to be donated by a human. And especially because of COVID, and schools not being in, blood is at an all-time low because most of the time what they do is they go into companies, they go into high schools, and they do these large-scale blood drives. Well, they weren't able to have those. So it's a really important thing to look up a local blood bank. You go there, it takes about maybe 30 minutes, and you basically just donate some blood. And it's, it seems super simple, but you don't know until you need it. So my daughter's life, I mean, this is like a, a fact, was saved, I'd say, three times because somebody donated blood. And I made a commitment that day and I'll, I'll make a commitment for the rest of my life to donate that back. Because again, if something happens to you or anybody you know, you can't pay for it. It had to be donated. And so I would encourage anybody to look that uh, up. Thank you for that. I, I wrote those down in the show notes. We'll, we'll, we'll spread awareness on that. Um, you know, right. That's, that's one of those things where unfortunately in life, uh, well, depending on how you look at it, but, you know, it takes a big event in, in most people's lives to bring them aware, right? Just like it did with you. Like you wasn't on your radar and now it is. And now you're like, why isn't everybody doing this? I want to help. So, you know, kudos to you for, you know, being one of those people that saw the light and now is, is trying to 
trying to spread that and, you know, doing shows like this and, and getting it out there is great, but I mean, it's just human nature, right? It's like, we just kind of moving along and focusing on everything else, but our, our health and, and that, and I think it's important kind of reminds me every single morning for my mantra, I have a, a gratitude list that I go through and it just starts the day out on such a, a great note. And one of those is, is the health of myself as well as my family. And, you know, just kind of reminding myself how lucky I am and my family is to have our health and our well-being. Um, and, and it just it, it helps to kind of give me that rocket boost in the beginning of the day and versus focusing on, you know, as most people, I think, tend to do the, the negative things in, in life. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's all about perspective, right? I mean, when you go through life, the older you get, the more life experiences you have the more you realize there's going to be tough days and good days. You got to celebrate the good days because you never know when the tough days are going to come back. And again, it's just all perspective, right? A bad day for someone could be a great day for somebody else. They just haven't had the same life experiences. And for me, going through what we've gone through, definitely there's a lot of gratitude when when the children are healthy, for sure. Absolutely. So let's talk about when I'm looking up, you look, looking at information and researching you, I see this information on Greg Glassman's controversial post, which you announced your dis, disaffiliation with the cross brand fit and NC fits. Do you want to talk about that? What, what went down there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not really too controversial. I mean, the, what happened is, so I was deep into CrossFit for a long time, taught seminars, had a CrossFit affiliate. And then over the years, we continue to pay an affiliation fee. We rebranded from uh, NorCal CrossFit at the time to NC Fit. And it was just to be in control of our own destiny, to be in control of our own brand. But we still continue to pay an affiliation fee more as a tip of the hat to the methodology that helped build the, the framework. And last year, you know, I tried really hard with the founder of CrossFit to create a relationship. And it was just a little bit of, um, we didn't necessarily see eye to eye on certain things. And then he went out there and made some specific comments and did some things. And we had some pressure and we ended up just, you know, removing the affiliation, not paying the fee anymore. It was more symbolic than anything. It didn't really change our brand or change anything. It was more just like, hey, we're kind of, we're kind of past that was completed. And now we're moving on to the next chapter. And I still have a lot of love for CrossFit. I have a lot of love for CrossFit affiliates. I'm deeply ingrained in the community. We've just decided to kind of have our own brand, our own mission of where we want to go. And, but now... CrossFit's under new ownership. So it's a little bit different. And uh, so things might change in the future. Who knows? Okay, great. And, and then, so you wrote a book, uh, as many reps as possible. So why don't you tell us about the, the evolution of, because I'm writing a book too. Mine's been 25 years in the making. So oh yeah, call me a procrastinator, but uh, right. I'm at the point now where one of my, I, I always talk about failure habits and success habits, and I'm going to I'm going to hit you with that question at the end. So, but you know, one of my biggest failure habits that I have is wanting everything to be perfect before I release it to the world. And it goes against everything that I now preach and, and know in my mind. And I can tell other people, which stems from a book called the lean startup. There's been other variations of it, but you know, basically minimal viable product, like just get it going, just do it, just get it out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. So I guess that's, that's my story of, of how I'm writing my book, but now I'm, I'm the point where this year it's going to be finished. I'm going to put it out. How, how did your journey go for writing your book? Yeah. I mean, so what happened is, you know, I competed professionally. I was traveling the world, opening up locations uh, all the time. And I would read business book after business book. And it has never really seemed to align with what I saw in my, in my career. And so after my daughter got sick, it really made me want to write something that was this idea of as many reps as possible. What that is, is just really a fitness analogy for doing as much as you can in as quick as you can. So let's just say it's a 10 minute AMRAP of burpees. You're just focused on doing as many burpees as you can in 10 minutes. You're not going to answer your phone. You're not going to be distracted. You're going to be all in. And the, after Ava got sick, I wrote a book about prioritizing, being focused on something, then switching gears. And what I found was that's the best way in my life that I was able to have those great relationships, build a business, enhance my fitness, because in each facet of it, I was focused and present at each one, like an AMRAP versus being one foot in one foot out. Like I'm on the phone with you, but I'm not, you know, I'm at a jujitsu gym right now, but it's not like I'm doing jujitsu trying to talk to you. I'm being really present and focused on this conversation so that I don't have to have regret later on. There were so many years that I would be on the assault bike or spin bike or whatever 
and taking conference calls or, you know, be with my kids, but thinking about competing. And it was just one foot in, one foot out. And so I really wanted to dedicate myself to being this as many reps as possible mindset. Later on, I chose to write the book. Now, to your point, it's never perfect. You got to just get it out there if you feel like your message was going to be valuable to someone somewhere. Yeah, kudos to you. Right. I mean, action, action, action. I, it's like we can have all the thoughts in the world and be like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. But you just it's those people in life that actually just just do it. Um, and then, you know, you learn. I'm sure you learned a ton from that first book. And maybe there's another book in the future that, you know, um, from the lessons and whatnot that you learned from it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, in particular, I mean, I learned a lot of lessons from actually writing the book and how that process went. I think that it was really well received. I don't at this point foresee myself writing another one, but I feel like I got out what I wanted to write and yeah. uh, now I feel good about it. Okay. Well, so speaking of getting it out, what, you know, what's next for you? Where do you see yourself in the next three to five years and, and, you know, what you're doing, not only for yourself and your family and where you want to be, but, you know, for this, this movement that you've created and, and helping the world get fit and better minds. Yeah, I mean, we just want to, we just want to spread fitness to as many people as possible. And whether you're doing that in our gyms uh, or through our online app, we're good, right? Um, you know, NC Fit's founded here in, in NorCal, but it's spread globally through our corporate wellness, through our locations, and then also through our digital products. And we just want to continue that, right? We want to have a phenomenal staff that's able to make a living off doing what they love and then be able to make an impact on as many members as possible. And that's really the kind of the mission of the company. And then to be able to eventually build this, grow this audience to then go back and do really good stuff for a greater community like blood drives or pediatric cancer or whatever other, uh, you know, ventures we decide to pursue. So that's our focus right now. That's what's going to be our focus has been our focus for a long time. And I don't really see anything changing in the next three to five years, just head down, keep moving towards those goals. Love it. And let me ask you this. Do you write your goals down or do you have them in your head? We have company goals that we specifically write down at the beginning of every year. Um, I do not um, specifically write down my goals, but I have ones in mind, like from a physical perspective, it's more so micro check-ins that I incorporate. So it would be like on a regular basis, just asking myself, hey, how am I doing as a husband, father, entrepreneur, et cetera? And is there areas that I can improve on micro? So that this way I don't wake up one day and you know be shocked that I was a terrible X, Y, Z, right? So these micro check-ins are really critical for me, especially either at night or in the morning to see how I can make these slight adjustments to then not have major corrections in the future that need to be made. So I'm going to throw a challenge at you. I dare you, not dare, but uh, I challenge you. This is like, what was it? What, was, what were those challenges they used to do? Like the, the ice fear factor? Challenge and whatnot. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but to, to write down, so... Are you familiar with the five cores that I talk about? So it's your mindset, it's your career and your finances, it's your relationships, it's your physical health, and then it's your the fifth core is your, your emotional health and giving back. I challenge you to write down uh, a one-year goal for each and then uh, to have, that, have a short-term goal tied to that, maybe like a three-month. And just, we can check back in, maybe we'll do another interview in a year and just see how that goes. Not that you don't seem to be somebody... Who, who kicks ass and takes names and, and does meet their goals. But I just found over the years, it's so easy for me if I just have it in my mind to get a little bit slack on it versus when it's, when it's in front of me and I have it part of my, and I do that as part of my daily routine. So if you do write them down, right, you got to at least check in, I say minimally once a week and just sort of say, okay, this is a reminder because life, mm. as you know, man, it, it has a way of just kind of all of a sudden now there's this introduced and now there's this and now there's a million things flying at you from over here and you just got whacked with this. And then all of a sudden it's like these things that are most important to you that you've determined are going to make you the most happy in life. And this is at your visceral core level, what you want and tend to get put off. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you're just crossing off to do's and, and doing things that maybe aren't making you the happiest and best self you can be. Yeah, for sure. I'll give that a shot. Yeah. I mean, I, I think writing down goals is a good thing. It just hasn't been something I've been really formally into since, you know, when you're professionally competing in a sport, you can write down specific goals with that, but I have more kind of ideas of what I'm trying to do, but yeah, it doesn't hurt to write those concepts down and those goals down. 
So I'm going to make it easier for you. So I have an app sure. that I'm developing that is going to be coming out um, in the next three to four months. And it actually gamifies what I just told you. So the whole point is because like we started the show talking about we're in this Insta generation and our attention span and what we're focusing on, especially these younger, these Gen Zers, you know, it's like, they just think they can get whatever they want with the press of a button. So um, this app is kind of using the same techniques that get people hooked to products and social media and whatnot. But when you level up on screen, you actually level up in real life. So it's got your five cores and you're this rocket ship. And you're going to basically set your goals in each and you're going to have little habits that you're trying to both stop in each and replace them with success habits in each. And then you run into little aliens along the way, asteroid fields. If you're not balancing and firing on all cylinders, you start to go off course. You're reaching different planets, different galaxies. It's going to be neat. So it's out, you know, if you have yours written down, I'll, I'll make sure to send that to you. And then when you get it, it, it hopefully it'll make it more fun or, and it's a simple check-in twice a day. In the morning, you check in and you just see, okay, these are my overall goals. How am I doing? You kind of get your mantra and the things you're grateful for. It's a list that kind of reminds you. And then at the end of the day, it's simply, okay, how did I do today? And you kind of score yourself. And it's kind of like a, a gamified way to hold yourself accountable. Got it. Love it. Yeah, man. So, okay. I mentioned earlier, so we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up soon here uh, the, about the success and the failure habits. I just talked briefly about how important they are. To me, kind of life comes down to your habits. Habits don't care if they're good or bad, helping or hurting you. Uh, either way, they're going to compound and do their thing over time. Would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. Let me ask you, do you have a failure habit that at one point in your life was really you know, hurting you, causing negative momentum, and then maybe a success habit that you were able to replace that with that's now allowing you to build that positive momentum in your yeah, I mean, look, uh, there's a lot of ways you could take that question. You could look at it from a business perspective, from a life perspective. You know, business perspective, I'm a terrible manager. You know, I had to learn how to delegate that out because the way I like to be managed doesn't, or I don't like to be managed, right? But people want to know what is the expectation? What is success? What is my description here? And instead of saying, hey, go do your job, giving clear, concise directions. So the way we solved that, obviously, was yes, myself taking more management courses to figure out how to understand different management styles to work with different people a different way or and or delegating that out to someone who has those skills that I don't have so I could focus more on things that I have skills in which is networking relationship building etc and leading the organization now from a personal perspective probably you know I'd say probably this concept that you know this idea that you want everybody to like you you know you got to kind of be yourself be a good human and especially with social media this day and age, like not everybody's going to love you and that's okay. As long as you feel like you are doing the right thing for the right reason and you're treating people the way you want to be treated, you can't always crave everybody's, what's the word I'm looking for? You can't always want everybody to love you, right? Because if you get fulfillment out of someone else liking you, you can't control that. And so you got to kind of find what makes you happy and then just be a good person. Uh, I love that. I love both of those. And yeah, I mean, it was an open-ended question. It could be any of your course. Sounds like you hit on the career and finance for your first one. And your mindset is what I would categorize that second one into, which is sort of, you're an owner of your life. You're not a victim. I call it a growth owner versus a fixed victim. And an owner says, I've got everything within me to kick ass, take names. Obstacles are temporary roadblocks. It's only a matter of time until I get there. Not worried about what other people think about me along the way. But of course, you know, you want to cultivate those relationships and, and that's, that's a whole nother core, but it's so important. And I'm glad you stressed that, especially for somebody as, as big as you are and has as many followers, you know, people probably just assume, oh my God, I wish I could just be him. And, and he's got so many people loving him and liking all his posts. And it's like, I'm only here. And it's like, okay, it's okay to have goals. And it's like, okay, if you're trying to build a business and a brand and you want to, you know, add, you know, engagement and followers and, and these types of things, but if you get caught up to where that's your identity, that's when you get in trouble where it's like, oh, wait, I only got 2,000 likes on this one versus 4,000 on my other one. What do they not, not like me anymore? Well, what do I need to do differently? Or it's like, no, just be confident in who you are and what you're doing. Keep producing the good stuff like you're doing and you can't please everybody. Some people are going to like yeah. it, who aren't going to get into it. Yeah, you got to be happy with yourself. And I think that trying to get fulfillment, I mean, social media is just like such a very, that's like a, a separate level that I'm talking about. I'm talking about even in your personal relationships and and whatnot, like you, it, there's just many layers to you finding happiness only if you, you need everybody around you to love you. 
it's just a slippery slope. That's all I'm trying to say. Balance. And well, you got to be careful. Are you yeah. Because like- you want to be a good person. You want people to like you because otherwise you might be a dick, right? But if you are, if there is someone who might not align with where, yeah. Anyways, I well, think I, you know. Well, I, well, I think I kind of know what you're saying. I mean, I'm just thinking back into when I ran. So I had a restaurant delivery service akin to like a Grubhub or a, a DoorDash. Um, we sold it in, in 2019. I ran that for 10 years and, you know, it gets to the point when you have a ton of people that and it goes back to your managing thing too. I mean, it's, it is a very tricky balance of being somebody that people like and respect and want to, you know, do well for and treat the business like their own versus, you know, a tyrant asshole who is barking orders, right? And and you can't not every, not all your employees are going to love you. One of the things that I learned early on that really really helped me. I read a book, recommend it to you as well. It's called The Energy Bus, and it was just basically get the right people on the bus and get the wrong people off immediately. And it just it all comes down to the people you surround yourself because you're going to have toxic relationships. There's going to be people that are sabotaging you know, your friendship, your, your, your business, whatever it is, because they don't see eye to eye with you. Don't waste your time. Don't fall victim to the sob stories. You know, don't try to be too nice, you know, just do what's best for you and for your company and get those people that are going to treat the business as if it's their own versus the ones that are just out for the paycheck and to, you know, suck as much money from your company as possible. And, you know, it's not easy to find those people. So I tell my team, always it's a full-time job you, we need to look at that not as like a nuisance that we have to do once in a while hire new people and, and clean house but an ongoing full-time prioritized part of our company is making sure that we have the right people on the bus and and that we're getting the wrong people off that are toxic and hurting things and we have like an accountability system and you know we, we actually between me and my my upper level people we we, we grade i mean we basically say, okay, these are the things that are important to us and that we need to see and how are they doing? And if they get a certain amount of low marks consistently, you know, two, three weeks in a row, it's time for that person to go. It kind of just shines a big spotlight on it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a little easier said, I, I agree with you hundred percent in business. It's so easy to say, hire slow, fire fast, right? People on the bus. And it, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's just been more difficult than it seems over the years to, to do what you're saying. Although I think it's critically important to success of the business, especially as we've expanded, you know, we've been in business for now 13 years and you just, you learn a lot about people along the process for sure. Yeah. And it it is really hard. And especially now, I mean, I just read this article this morning, like the hospitality industry. I mean, this is happening like COVID changed things big time. Oh yeah, for sure. They're not going to go back to the way they were. And it opened up a lot of people's eyes to wait a minute. I can have a better quality of life, make just as much money, if not more, and, you know, work from home or work from the beach or wherever versus, you know, so so the hospitality industry in particular is getting hammered. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you're feeling it where you are, but, you know, every restaurant we go, every, um, there's always weight, huge weights now. There's just not enough people willing to kind of go back. I mean, when they were all for furloughed during, during COVID, they had to go find other jobs. And now they're like, well, wait, I don't want to go back to that. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. It's a combination of things. I mean, obviously we're, we're in that you know space where we're trying to find staff for front desk and different stuff, but I think it's a combination of things, right? Obviously people who COVID made them change their career path, of course, right? Government assistance in some cases isn't helping because it's actually encouraging people not to go back to work, right? In some areas. And then the other is like, um, you know, again, this theory that some people, you know, still don't feel comfortable going back into work because they don't feel safe. So it's like, I don't know when those three things are going to kind of. Right. Well, mesh, the, you know? the government assistant, right. That ends. What is that? Is it next month? I think it's the yeah, last soon. month. Maybe yeah. it's even this month, next month, maybe. Um, so I agree that, that, you know, that's going to be like, okay. Um, but, you know, like, even, even after all, with all those factors, you know, companies, the, the, even the big companies, they're not, I think that, they're going to have a hard time getting people back in five days a week from nine to five commuting. I live in Chicago. I live in a suburb called Evanston, which is about 20 minute, 25 minute train ride to the city. And most of my, but I, I work from home, but most of my buddies, you know, they were spending an hour, sometimes an hour and a half a day yeah. on the commute, right. Commute. And it's like, 
that's not, that's time you can't get back to spend with your family, to do the things you want to do. And most of them went to that hybrid model or, or totally at home where it was like, wait a minute, I can get just as much work done and I'm making just as much money and I still have time to play golf and spend more time with my family and do the things that I love. And it's like, people got spoiled on that. Uh, and, you know, and so to me, this was a catalyst that even though it was an awful thing that happened, kind of needed to happen. And, you know, it's going to play out. It's going to play out the way it's going to play out. Yeah. I'm really interested to see what happens here in the next like year or two. I think you're going to see a lot of adjustments and changes made. Yeah, for sure. Well, Jason, man, thank you so much, brother. This has been awesome. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Jason, you were a superstar, brother. Thanks for answering all my questions and, and dropping some good wisdom on everybody. Yeah. Have a great day. Hope you have a good one. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. That's it for the five core life. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like button on this video and pound that subscribe button. So you get notified when new episodes drop. Also, please fill out the free five core life evaluator quiz. It's a great way to get a baseline of where you are and the five cores and which of the five cores you need support. In addition, you'll get some actionable advice that you can apply and start improving your life in the areas that you need it most. That's it for today's episode of the five core life podcast. Have a wonderful day. Get moving, gain momentum, join the movement. Join Emmett by going to moremomentum.com to take a free life evaluator quiz on where you currently stand in each of your five course. 